Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter, beginning with verse 2. Then some Pharisees came, and to test Jesus, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, he wrote, this, he wrote this commandment for you because of your hard hearts. But from the beginning of creation, he made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. In the house once again, the disciple asked him about this. So he told them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Now people were bringing little children to him for him to touch. But the disciples scolded those who brought them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not try to stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let's get a couple things out of the way right off the bat about this reading. In verse 4, when we read, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her, the Pharisees are citing the law as spoken by Moses and recorded in the book of Deuteronomy, where there are lots of laws. In verse 5, when Jesus says, He wrote this commandment for you, Moses, because of your hard hearts. Jesus is referring to the fact that ancient scribes, or teachers of the law, sometimes recognized that some of Moses' laws were written as concessions to human weakness. Civil laws don't necessarily represent God's ideals. Typically, they merely place limits on human sin. For example, the law of Moses forbade marrying a wife's sister, but not polygamy per se. It limited the abuse of slaves, but did not outlaw slavery per se. Jesus appeals to a divine ethic more complete than Israel's civil law. In verses 6 and 7, which includes, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother, and the two will become one flesh, Jesus is quoting Genesis, where God paired the man and woman so that husband and wife could reproduce. One flesh was a common term for family, everyone in the family being of one flesh. Today we would probably say something like um, same blood. All that to say, what is important to understand in today's gospel is at the time this was written, a man divorcing his wife was akin to a death sentence for her. 
She relied on him for security and income. It's not like today when, after a divorce, she could just go back to practicing law or touring with the opera or leading a community of faith. She often would not be welcomed back even into her father's home. So the reality of divorce for many women then is that it sentenced them to a life of poverty or begging or prostitution. So Jesus' point was something like this. It is not enough for you to give her a certificate of divorce. You must attend to her dignity. Or put another way, God loves you and your spouse and desires that cruelty and violence happen to neither of you. In a nutshell, Jesus was trying to protect women. That is what this passage is really all about. And in today's context, I would extend that to say that Jesus also wants to protect men. Today, men can lose all their possessions, their money, their children, their status, and even their jobs in a divorce. But before I say much more about divorce, I want to talk briefly about what always, always, always precedes a divorce, and that is marriage. I looked up quotes about marriage when preparing this sermon. Very few of them spoke favorably about the institution. One quote said, marriage is like deleting all the apps on your phone except one. Another said, these are the top three situations that require witnesses. One, crimes. Two, accidents. Three, marriages. When I googled jokes about marriages, the first hit I got showed 200 jokes. Then I googled jokes about divorce and got 15. You know why? There's nothing funny about a divorce. Seriously, most pastors would prefer to officiate at a funeral than at a wedding. That's partly because a pastor can be more certain at a funeral of what the future looks like for at least the one in the couple who has died. At a wedding, there's always some lingering doubt about whether or not one of the two is eventually going to kill the other one. I wish that were purely a joke, but the reality is that while weddings are often wonderful celebrations, marriages just as often are filled with as much pain as joy. And we all know that every marriage is a gamble with pretty even odds of either a long and happy life or a hard and miserable divorce. Finally, the last part of today's gospel that is interesting is the last section on Jesus welcoming and blessing the children. The upshot of this part is that those who hope to enter the kingdom of God must do it as children, which begs the question, what sets a child apart from an adult that would cause Jesus to say that we must come to the Lord as children if we hope to enter the kingdom of God? Is it because as a person gets older, they become wiser? And in doing so, they think they have less of a need for God because they can figure things out for themselves? Is it because children are so painfully honest and are more likely to blurt out the truth to Jesus? The good, the bad, and the ugly of what is happening in and around them? Or is it because when a child approaches an adult, in this case Jesus, who claims to love them, the child fully expects to be loved. In a community of faith, we mark the transition into adulthood through ceremonies such as confirmation. A confirmation, a young adult agrees that the laws that govern their faith are true. And they choose to live out their faith as well as they possibly can, not because a parent insists that they do so, but because they believe in what they have been taught. At confirmation, the one being confirmed also recognizes that the process of confession and forgiveness is a gift from God 
that is designed to help us when we fall short of our intentions to live as God hopes we will. And we all know that loving one another as God intended is so much easier said than done. And that seems to be something we learn more and more about as we give, get older. Given that definition of what it means to become an adult, it is easier to see how the topics in today's gospel come together. Divorce, adultery, and the difference between being a child and an adult. Because surely there is something beyond confirmation that marks the transition into adulthood. We cease to be children when we realize that the, adult, the adults we love and admire, the people we expect to love us and who have the responsibility for taking care of us, are capable of doing really bad things. It is when something happens that shows the child the people are not all good or all bad, but they are all broken, and that they hurt one another both intentionally and by accident all the time. And the child usually discovers this when an adult they expected to only love them does something to hurt the child. We call it a loss of innocence. It is as if an invisible wall of protection that once surrounded the child is suddenly broken. And the reality of the world and the pain people cause one another comes busting through. And it takes all forms. A child's parent is in an auto accident with a drunk driver. A child's parent is the drunk driver. A child's brother reportedly gets in trouble, causing his parents to yell and cry and fight with one another over how to address his behavior. A child tells her mother a story about something that is very important to the child, and then the child notices the way the parent is engaging with something on a screen and knows that they didn't listen to a word she said. A child's parents get a divorce. There is no denying that Jesus says outright in today's lesson, that divorce is not a part of God's plan for people. And we know that what makes a couple married is not the license that is signed by those who witness the wedding. It is the vows the couple makes to one another. What keeps a couple married is the extent to which they honor and keep those vows in every way, every single day of their lives. And by that definition, we are all guilty to some extent of separating that which God has joined together. Consider how different marriages look from one couple to the next. There are those whose marriages have just begun, who are still basking in the glow of their bridal dance and trying to outdo each other with acts of love. There are those who have been married for decades who never fish, finish a sentence because their partner finishes it for them, and who would gladly feed the other spoonful by spoonful if it meant having more time together on earth. There are those who have been married a short time but who are already wondering if the whole thing was a mistake and if they should save all those involved a lot of pain by raising the white flag early or whether time will shed healing light onto the agony of their daily existence. And some couples marvel every day at their good fortune in finding one another, and they are able to courageously face painful experiences because they have one another to cling to, and the depth of their love keeps them strong. And those are only a few of the situations that describe what it means to be married. So when Jesus condemns divorce, it seems he is not merely speaking of the act of dissolving a marriage. He is speaking of all the things that people do to separate themselves from one another, the things they do to hurt one another. It's the first time you go to bed without saying goodnight to your spouse. It's the first time your spouse is ill and you resent having to get up and get them some soup. 
It's the first time you tell your friend what it is about your spouse that drives you nuts and your friend feeds your dissatisfaction, acting horrified, fanning the flames of your discontent. It begins when you would prefer to spend your time with your parents or your children or your friends at the gym maybe, and you don't think to question why this is so. Maybe that is why Jesus responds in this way, because in his infinite wisdom, Jesus can see the violence we do to one another as we do it. And Jesus knows that left unchecked and unforgiven, Jesus knows where it leads. So what do we do? How do we faithfully attend to our relationships? Given the fact that our human tendency is to separate what God has joined together in a myriad of ways, both consciously and unconsciously. Maybe the answer is not necessarily in what Jesus says, but in who Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus established a way to reconcile the pain that comes when we do things that pull apart what God has joined together. That way is called forgiveness, and it's available to everyone. It marks the beginning of new life. New life in relationships, new life in marriages, new life in reconfigured families of divorce. New life in the eyes of all the children who are watching us adults show them what it means to live our faith. And the good news is this. Forgiveness is not just available to you. It is promised by the only one who is able to consistently fulfill a promise. Forgiveness, perhaps, was created because God knew how badly we would need it. It means that God is with us throughout our trials. It means that the Holy Spirit will help us change if change is what our heart and soul want and need to live in peace. It is there for those who get divorced and for those who remain married. It is there whether you are happily married or whether your marriage is filled with pain. For all of us, as we strive to keep the vows we've made, and when we inevitably break them, forgiveness is God's way to help us find our way home. And when at last we each arrive home, the one who greets us there is Jesus. Knowing all the circumstances of our lives, all the things that caused us to hurt and be hurt, all the vows we broke, all the love we knew, Jesus will take us into his arms and bless us when we come to Jesus as children, anticipating love. That is exactly what we will receive. And this is important. When you consider the way the church has often treated those who are divorced or who are seeking one, we still, in 2021, tend to leave divorced people sitting alone in church. Not necessarily because we take issue with their being divorced, simply because until you've sat in a church as a divorced person, you may not fully appreciate how lonely and shameful it can feel. No matter how much pain you endured before the divorce set you free, from the one inflicting it. Nadia Boltz Weber invited people to write to her the stories of their divorce. After collecting their stories, she said, when I read about you being violently yelled at and slapped and choked, and then having church folks stand over you and say that God loves you only if you stay with the man who does this to you. When I read about another of you being a 24-year-old woman who was literally abandoned by your husband, and then how your church would no longer give you communion. When I heard of the shame felt by one of you as a divorced man who felt like he wore a scarlet letter D in the church. When I heard of loveless marriages that went on for decades, I thought, how the hell is it that the church can manage to take a text meant to protect people 
and make sure violence is not done to them and use the same text to justify violence for so long. If you are one who has had your pain multiplied by the way the church responded to your divorce or separation or your marriage, from this pulpit and under the yoke of this stole, and from the office of a clergy person and whatever authority that still manages to hold in this world, I want to offer an apology. As a representative of the Church of Jesus Christ, please hear me say, I am so sorry this happened. If you are someone who has had violence, emotional, spiritual, physical, or otherwise done to you in the name of Jesus Christ, if you have been shamed or excluded or denied what is only God's to give, if you have been made to stay in a situation that denies your humanity or kills your soul because someone said that's what God wants for you, on behalf of the church, I apologize. We do not serve a distant God but one who actually cares about how you treat people and how you are treated. People matter. Relationships matter. The dignity of human beings matters. You matter whether you have been married for a lifetime or whether you are currently seeking your third spouse. As we step into a new era of the church, may we remember and remind one another of this fundamental truth. Love one another sums up what we are to do. When we do not do so, the forgiveness and reconciling power of Jesus Christ is how we begin to untangle the damage and restore dignity to all those who have been hurt by the church, where Jesus opens his arms to all. Support this ministry using the number below. Text your contribution. It's that easy.